say them first and then if you need to write something down write it down but I wouldn't write anything yet let's just talk for a minute um, you're going to encounter problems on the AP test where they'll say something like you know consider the differential equation when they say consider they're not telling you to do anything yet so don't automatically start working got to read some more if they say consider the differential equation and then it says something like find the equation of a line tangent, well, you're going to go do that stuff, okay? Uh, but when they say differential equation, what your brain should be saying is, hey, they're giving me a derivative. So when they say differential equation, they're giving you a derivative. Like on the last 2003 test, uh, problem number five had something like that, where in the beginning of the problem, they actually they didn't, didn't show up till here. So in this one, it says right here, you know, solve the differential equation. Okay, a differential equation is a derivative. It's a formula for finding the slope at any point of some other curve. You need to have that memorized. Uh, the golden notes help with that right here on the golden notes the very top there's a box that says dy dx is a formula for finding you know slope of a line tangent to f uh, you need to have that memorized so when they say something like this solve this differential equation your brain should be saying hey they're giving me a derivative what do they want me to do with it well, if they want you to solve the differential equation, they want you to work backwards and find the other equation. It's Danica's chart. They're giving you this column in Danica's chart. Like, they're giving you the H prime column. And they're asking you to work backwards and find the formula for H. That's what it means to solve a differential equation. Now, in some problems, you just use the differential equation. So, like, find a line tangent or something or you use the differential equation to create a slope field. But solving the differential equation means you're going backwards to here. And that's the SASE method. So if it's solving a differential equation, if it's finding the solution to a differential equation, uh, if it says find the particular solution to a differential equation, all of those are referring to this. Now, I can talk as much as you want about that, but you've got to Help me if you have more questions on that idea. Okay, related rates. Let's see. Okay, if we're working on a related rate problem, which number was it? Uh, 18. No, I had it right, honey. <coughs> <coughs> there we go. Okay, if we're look, working on a related rate problem, uh, the way you determine that it's related rate is as you're reading the question, you discover that they're giving you one rate and they want you to find another rate. Or they're giving you two rates that are somehow related to each other and they want you to find some other value. <coughs> so it's all about, as you read the problem, you see that they're giving you multiple rates 
and those multiple rates are somehow connected to each other. And they want you to find like another rate or they want you to find some value. Uh, that's when you use this, the dread. More questions? I don't know if that helps. Are those the only ones we use? Mainly Sassy and Dread? So Dread is only for related rate okay. problems. Uh, Sassy is only for when they say solve a differential equation, find the solution to a differential equation, find the particular solution to the differential equation, uh, find an equation that satisfies the differential equation, that's about four different ways I can remember them asking that particular question. And that's all that's for. With that for drive. Say again. That's for Sassy. That's for Wait, what's the wording that they'll use? Should it solve? So for dread, there's not a specific word. They'll just for give you related, related like they'll give two you rates. And two or more. And you'll see that, oh, these rates are associated with each other okay. somehow. And most, another clue is this one, Christian. Most related rate problems have some sort of geometry involved. Like it's a sphere that's growing, or it's a circle that's shrinking, or it's a length that's lengthening. So, so. Are there any other <coughs> acronyms we use? I don't remember any other. The golden notes have everything, but I don't recall any other acronyms yeah, on the golden notes. Wait, is dread on here? <laughs> Uh, Dread, I don't think I found. I know, I'm, I'm like not sure if I found room for that one. I see Sassy. Sassy's on there. Dread, I don't think is on there. Yeah. As long as I know the difference between those two, I won't get them mixed. Yeah, they're distinctly different. Yeah, distinctly different. <laughs> <laughs> I knew better when you said Dread. I would have been like anti derivative for the AI. No. No worries. Sassy is you start with a, diff a derivative <coughs> and you just gotta go backwards. That's sassy. Related, related rates. Related rates more like I have a rate, I want another rate. You know? <coughs> so solving the rest of the problem. Okay, so I got this written down, right? Barn. Why is it A that's at the rate? Because if it's getting longer at that rate, what do you mean when the I couldn't hear you say it again. Wouldn't it be the rate for DB over DT? Because if he's walking away from the lockdowns, then that's going to be longer. Uh, the rate we're trying to find is definitely DBDT. Is that what you meant? Yeah, but doesn't it say it's lengthening at that rate? What it says is the shadow lengthens at this rate. So here's the light. Here's the man or person. This is the shadow. It has a length of A. Oh, because the shadow is a You're good. That makes sense. Two pebbles. Is everybody good to hear? Okay, um, EA stands for find an equation that involves the amount. <coughs> okay, all eyes, like everybody looking at me. You see this kind of a picture in a problem, 99% chance it's similar triangles. Like they've done it in multiple ways over the years, triangle within a triangle. So you just create a ratio. But I like to put letters on the top, numbers on the bottom, it makes the work easier. So this, B plus A, is this side of the bottom triangle. Eight is this side of the, sorry, this side of the large triangle. Eight is this side of the large triangle. And then I have to compare it proportionally to the small triangle. So this side of the big corresponds to this side of the little. This side. Say again. Are you supposed to know you're supposed to do that? Memorize. So, this is new, this idea that we you know, do Danica's chart, we list the rates. Okay, when they say find an equation involving the amounts, you are on your own to use whatever math knowledge you've acquired throughout your life. That's just how they write the problems. Um, no, ask and ask how we're supposed to know. That's, they're just expecting you to recall 
something from your past. Uh, but similar triangles is an easy one. It's just a proportion. Just set up a two fractions. It's easy. Please. So with the rate correlating with the amount, how did you know that B and A were like the length from the light post and the length of the shadow? Is it because the top rate has to deal with the shadow growing and the bottom rate has to deal with the person walking? It's very good. So they, as he moves, this will get longer and longer. So that's why I knew that the ADT was this. Then they say he's walking, right? They want you to find the rate at which he walks. Well, the rate at which he's walking is exactly the same as how fast this gets longer. Okay. Does that feel okay? Yeah. Yeah. That's all. Two fellows for Christian. Why do you think the derivative is longer? So what does the last D stand for? Take the derivative of the equation. So I created the equation. I did a little rearranging to just make my life easier. Now I take the derivative of both sides. That's what the last D stands for. Okay, everybody look here, look here. Everybody looking up. Okay, with the related rate problem, I, will, I can guarantee you, lots of students get stuck until I remind them of this, and then they don't get stuck. It's really crucial. It makes a huge difference. You just go over one more time and they all stand for something uh -huh. like that. So the D of the first is just Danica's chart. And Zach, two couples, we'll do this a lot. Like there are lots and lots of AP problems where I'm going to put a mountain range. And if you'll always focus on amount versus rate, it makes a big difference. On this test, I saw quite a few people uh, in places on this one where they asked for an explanation. They lost points because they didn't use the word amount where they should have, and didn't use the word rate where they should have. So keeping that really clear makes a huge difference. So. Uh, R is just rates. So when I build the chart, Zach, I don't start with this column. I start with this column. Once I have these written down, it's easy to know what goes here. EA is the part Aspen asked about. You must come up with an equation that involves the amounts. The few equations, Aspen and everybody else, that you must have memorized are similar triangles, Pythagorean's theorem, <coughs> Sokotoa, uh, area of a circle, circumference of a circle, area of a triangle, area of a rectangle. All the other formulas, I've never seen them require that you have them memorized. They just give you the formula. So, like volume of a sphere, volume of a cylinder, that sort of thing. So. Last one is take the derivative of your equation with respect to time. So that's the step. Here's that. So once I take the derivative, then I do what I do on all AP problems. Everybody, come on, listen. You do some work, and then you're like, okay, now what? Go back and read again. Like, figure out what it is they're asking me to find. So right here, I'm like, oh, didn't really notice, but I just found what I'm looking for. Because I have dBdt equals this. You pull off the 3, so you get 3, dA over dt is dBdt. And dBdt is, a, is what they're asking for. So rereading is crucial in lots of AP problems. You do some work, like, okay, now what? Just read again. Okay, I've said this before, I'll probably say it a lot in the next 20 days in class. Passing the AP test is simple. I give you a packet, like this one was to study. You work the problems, you figure out where, you know, where are you missing points? Where are you? not getting it. <coughs> if it's just memory, you fix that with flashcards. If it's things you don't understand, that's why it came at 6.30 this morning, so I'm planning to stay till 5 tonight. So you have hopefully lots of time to just talk about what doesn't make sense. If you'll train day by day, like a marathon, okay, actually Ella, 
you'll be fine. She got a four. She no way thought she could get a four when she started this class. Okay, but she just did it day by day. Had another student. I have lots of them. I just put it on my list. I can go name after name after name. One student last year, her parents came and talked to me in like September. Mother and father, very unusual that both come. And they're like, Maggie's not good at math. Okay. <laughs> But she's, she really wants to take AP calculus. But, but by the way, Maggie's not good at math. Can she handle it? I'm like, I don't know. I've never really worked with her. But if she'll work day by day, little by little, and just be willing to talk when it doesn't make sense, she'll be fine. She got four. Um, anyway. Other questions here? Other questions? Different problems. Different problems. Please. Do you need to spell 28? 28? Yeah. What is this D? Oh my gosh. So talk to me about 28. Um, we're trying to find the area of some sort of. Hey, uh, the last one, what number was the last one? 18. 18, thank you. It's making a list. Okay, look. When they ask you to find the area, drawing a picture is exactly where I would start. And I think I joked with all of you that I don't expect you to remember what these look like, so I always draw the same picture. Okay? So now what do I need? I need the intersection. So how do you find the intersection? Set these equal to each other and solve. So it's a quadratic, so you don't solve by isolating, you solve by factoring. Got to get everything together, so move the x over. Factor. <coughs> now I know the intersection. Once I know the intersection, I've got to figure out which graph is on top. So I test. A uh, good point to test that here is x equal 2. So let's see. This formula, if x is equal to 2, y will also be 2. So that was pretty easy. The other formula, if x is equal to 2, I'd have y equals, let's see, 2 squared, 3 times 2, plus 3. Why are we picking up point? Let's read. I'm just letting it pause for a second. I want to figure out which function is above the other. Because when I go to find area, I need to go top, subtract, <coughs> bottom. So. So. Which function is on top? Y equal x. So the integral I create looks like this. It must have parentheses. Minus. <coughs> Might as well clean that up a little bit. <coughs> so these two combine to uh, distribute the negative. So that's going to be, let's see, x minus x squared plus 3x minus 3. So that's negative x squared plus 4x minus 3. Questions to there. 
Uh, the question today is very good. Just keep speaking up about anything. <coughs> so now you have to find the antiderivative and then bar it. Wait with me if you need to see more stuff. So I'm going to cheat because I'm tired of writing. So here's the posted solution. <coughs> So here's where we're at. So antiderivative is here. Here's the bar. So <coughs> the middle theorem says this integral is equal to the antiderivative test writers have a preference for the answer of four-thirds since the two problems you've asked me about now both have the same answer of four-thirds. So, so always go with four-thirds. Go with four-thirds. Yeah. <coughs> go to buy a used car. What color do you like? Four-thirds. Yeah. Huh? <coughs> what? Sorry, I just I'm confused on how you found the, which one is the top again. Mm -hmm. So let me kind of talk you through it. You need to talk the most. Yeah. So are you comfortable that if we've got an area that is enclosed by two graphs, uh -huh. somehow the two graphs have got to cross. Okay. So are you okay with the intersection? Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, what's the purpose of this formula? Um, Good. Finds all the points. Uh -huh. What's the purpose of this formula? Finding Same thing. So I just looked at my picture and said, well, I'm starting at x equal 1. <coughs> I go to x equal 3. One of these creates a bunch of points, so does the other. But I want to know which one's higher. Right? Mm -hmm. So I just picked an x value in the middle. Okay, so 2. And I figured out if I plug a 2 into here, what <coughs> right corner do you get? You get one. You plug it two into this oh, one. Oh, it's just two. So then the bigger right. one is, is higher. Like X. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So at x equal two, this graph has a y coordinate of two. At x equal two, this y coordinate is only one. So now I know that's the top one. Question? Trouble? Anybody else? You would have a different question you wanted to discuss. You're welcome. Look what it says here. It 
it says find the derivative of stop, right? So anytime you need to find a derivative, your brain has got to remember the right <coughs> side of the golden notes, the front page. Down the right column are all the derivative rules. Please raise your hand when you identify. Wait, you mean the left? The left. This one's down the left. The right. Left. left. Thank you. I get mixed up because I keep turning different directions. My bad. Sorry. So left side. Wait, wouldn't you do that in the first? No, that's the trick. Okay. Listen. Hey, no, no, listen. That's what they're trying to get you to do so you get the wrong answer. Okay? We have a formula for finding the derivative of an integral. Please raise your hand when you have found that formula on the golden note. Come on. Who can see the formula for finding the derivative of an integral? It was down the left column. Just keep going until you find it. Who is that? Come on. Who can see it? There we go. Two pebbles. Mark them down. Okay, if you haven't done number 30, use that rule and do number 30. Raise your hand when you have the right answer. If you've already done number 30, raise your hand. I'll pay you right now. If you already have the right answer, show me. Raise your hand. things multiplying, so I have to use the product rule. So I took the second function, wrote it down, multiplied by derivative of the first, plus first multiplied by derivative of the second. There. Uh, dx over dx is just once, so that simple. Here I have to use the power rule. So I've got the x, bring down the 3, Multiply by the something, the new power is 2, and then I must multiply by the derivative of the something. But this derivative is just negative 2, and negative 2 multiplied by 3 will give me negative 6x. So that's the derivative. Like, what are mistakes? What's your advice on that? On like, 
Yeah. 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 So there's no one answer like, oh, if you do this, it'll always work. But things that do help. Um, make sure you do your work going down the page. Don't ever go across. Uh, make sure that as you go line to line, you're, you're really tracking both. Like as I go from this line to this line, I'm looking to see that I truly maintain the equal sign. So I really want my eye to see that this, this is the same, this is one. There's the X, so that can help. Um, practice helps, so that's why we'll start playing the game a lot. Just lots of practice. Uh, the game, the, way, the reason why the game is popular for a lot of people is it's just easier to come here and work than it is to work at home. Like here, there's a whole room full of people. There, you know, I can help answer questions. You're with your friends. We do a music quiz at the end of the game, so just for lots of extra pebbles that way. Um, it's just an easier place to, to learn. But um, sometimes using both hands can help prevent mistakes. Where like when I go to plug something in, I'll put, I'll go like this. Like here's my equation. So as I'm writing, one hand's here, and I'm going, okay, f prime of one. So I've got one minus. Uh, always put parentheses around the variable. That helps. Cube. There's the minus. 6, parenthesis 1, parenthesis, uh, making bigger and smaller parentheses can help. So I do that a lot. Um, good questions. You'll be okay. Hey, if your struggle is like algebra, making arithmetic mistakes, uh, by the time May 14th arrives, you'll be fine. That's never been a reason why people didn't pass the test. People don't pass the test because they don't do anything for 20 days. That's Seriously, that's why. They try to show up for the marathon having never run more than a mile. Suddenly thinking they can run 26. They're like, I'm smart. I, I have lots of willpower. I can do it. You can't. So. Other questions here? You want us to come prepared to talk about any other problems? 18. 18. Back to what um, Hadley asked about. Just pay close attention to making sure it's the same. So there's my one third. The one third is going to multiply by a bunch of stuff. So I put a parenthesis. This becomes three t to the fourth over four. T cubed over three. Then we bar it. Question. Keep going. Replace all variables with parentheses. Make sure when you subtract, you put another parenthesis. Uh, 
this parenthesis needs one, like that. So. Questions? Please. Uh, algebraically, does it matter if you add a strictly the one third A? Is that okay? Uh -huh. Either way. Question 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 Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Two to the fourth is 16. 16 divided by 4 is 4, so this is 12. This to the fourth power would be positive. Distributing would make it negative. This would be negative, positive, back to negative. Question? To make negative nine thirds, which is negative three. So I've got twelve, negative three, negative three fourths. So that's going to be nine. So nine is thirty six over four. That divides eleven over four. Is that the correct answer? Question? Please, Lord. So, when you went from the step up, like why do you minus the two different equations when you take and you find that minus one and two? Like right here? Yeah. So, grab your golden note. Look, right side, just a little below Susie's circle, you find this one. You got this. Okay, so we're using this. We're saying, hey, we're trying to find an integral. We have no calculator. So we think of the integral as the integral of f prime. The fundamental theorem says this integral is the same as just taking f. So you tell me, how is f prime related to f? Uh, Good. So that means f is the antiderivative. So I take the antiderivative of f prime. So that's what we did here. We took the antiderivative of this. So this is my f prime. This is my f. And then I need to take f of 2 and f of negative 1, just like you see on the paper. And I need to subtract them. That's the fundamental thing. So that's your question. Okay, you good? Yeah. Anybody else? Please. So, this makes sense to negative, but when you have negative 1 cubed, doesn't that <coughs> so make 1 again, and then would be adding the third? Over here? Yes. So, negative 1 cubed is definitely negative. Yes. So, multiplied by this negative makes it positive again. But when you distribute this negative, it goes back to negative. Please, Mikhail. Oh, I just have a problem. Do it. We also have questions here. Ms. Bravery. Go ahead, Mikhail. Can we do number 12? 12? Raise your hand if you can explain to me the big idea of this problem, not the little steps, but the big idea. Who knows the big idea of this problem? I'll pay you. All who know. What is the big idea of this problem? Isaac? I think about like just, you're just trying to find the point when t or the t prime 
for x, x prime equals zero, or the velocity is zero? It's perfect. So they're giving you the velocity, the position of a particle. You've correctly memorized that the particle will be at rest when the velocity is zero. So I need the derivative of this, and I need to find the value of t, which will cause this to equal zero. How many knew it? Two pebbles. Well done. Um, so, did, were you okay that far? You got stuck later, or no? It was that. Just that part. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay. Good question. Please. Um, so, understand how to find when the particle's at rest, but. How do you know where it changes direction or when it's the farthest from the origin? Um, so look at your golden notes. Go to the back. Right here, top half of the page is the big box relating to particles that are moving. Oh. And right here is part of your question. Mm -hmm. Um, at time e this is an example. Mm -hmm. At time equal three seconds, the velocity changes sign, so the particle will change direction at that time. Okay, so if you're looking for where it changes sign, how do you do that from the equation? Oh, two more pebbles. We'll pay this to the whole room. Okay, all eyes on me. Come on, it's a good question. Look, you're taking the AP test, you encounter exactly the dilemma that Rachel's describing. You're like, hey, it's the non-calculator section, but I've got to figure out when, like, not this problem, but something similar. I'd have to figure out when the velocity changes sign. So raise your hand if you know what tool you have learned this year that allows you to figure out when an equation changes sign without a calculator. And everybody remembers. You all did it. You had a test on it. You forgot. It's OK. That's what we're reviewing for. Weston. We do that plus. Perfect. Uh, oh. I call it a sign chart, but the plus name thing is good enough. <laughs> yeah. No, really. The names don't matter. No one's going to test you on the name. So you do a sign chart. Sign chart, look, if you have a graph, you always use a graph. It's much better than a sign chart. But if you don't have a graph, sign chart's your next best choice. Okay. So that's what or I would guess. Do. Sign yeah, chart. I uh, guessing is never a good option on the AP test until you've done everything else. If you've done lots of good work, guessing can be helpful. If your primary strategy is guessing, your score will be this. So. Oh, I've been pointing up. Also. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, if your primary strategy is guessing, this is guarantee your score. Guarantee. Oh, guarantee. What I did was found the derivative of the equation and then factored it. Do you think usually that will work or that I should have mm -hmm. That's, no, you're good. That's the primary strategy. So. Please. And what about when it's farthest from the origin? Oh, yeah. Um, so there was an FRQ question in the packet we just did. Yeah, that that's that what I it asked. You're fine. So here's what I did. Um, Read the name, too. Brennan Dahl. And Brennan. There you go. Please deliver the warrant. <laughs> okay, come on. Eyes on me. Look up. Look up. Look up. Okay, Rachel's question is a good example of if you will make the mental effort to make sense of what I'm about to say problems in the future become immensely easier, not just a little bit, like a lot easier. So make sense of what I'm now saying. You have a particle, it's just going back and forth, right? Okay, first thing I would have done on this particular problem is they give me a formula for the velocity. I have a calculator, I would graph it. Graphing always helps. So here's the velocity graph. So we'll pay pebbles to the whole room. As you look at this graph of velocity, what do you know about the particle motion? Hands up, come on. Don't think complicated, think simple. Most AP questions really are not complicated. They just write them in a way that makes them seem complicated. But really, they're not. Like once you, once you, hey, I told you, hey, I told you since August, if you'll make the effort to understand, it becomes immensely easier. 
If you just say, I don't understand this, I'll try to memorize it. It's hard all the time. And that's true of anything you're going to study. Anything you study. Once you understand it, it just becomes a lot easier. But it takes work to understand. So what is this telling you? Come on, pay everything. What is it telling you? What's this telling you? I look. So the particle is moving left until it crosses over zero because the velocity is negative. Perfect. So for all of this time, the particle is going left. So watch. The particle starts. Let's draw a picture. The particle starts somewhere. How many knew that before I had this set up? Two pelvis. Okay. So the particle starts somewhere. Let's get a blank screen here. So let's see, we've got a particle moving along a line. Here's location zero. Okay, location zero is always the origin. Look, we have a lot of people have trouble because they haven't memorized that origin means location zero. Origin does not mean original location, it's just the middle. This particle starts here, location one. It goes left. Okay, pebbles for the whole room. If the particle goes left and stops here, and then it goes right and happens to stop here, please raise your hand if you could tell me, if that were the case, what would be the greatest distance between the particle and the origin for that sequence? I'll pay everybody. What would be the greatest distance between the particle and the origin, Tristan? One. How many agree? Two pebbles. Question? Okay, what if the particle does this? Starts here, goes left to say here, see negative one, negative two, and then goes right to say here. Please raise your hand if you can tell me what would be the greatest distance between the particle and the origin for that sequence. So what, Chase? Three. How many knew it? Two pebbles. Okay, the, the point of understanding I'm trying to make is, is this. There are only three key times I have to worry about. I need to worry about where the particle starts. I need to worry about when it stops going left. And I need to worry about when it finishes its journey. It will be farthest from the origin at one of those three times. Right, it's exactly what we talked about. It's what I call the min-max theorem. You're looking for when the position, if you look, it's Danica's chart again, amount rate. You're looking for when the position is actually farthest from the origin. So you want a max or min of the position. The rate of position is velocity. The min-max theorem says, I can find where this is furthest from the origin if I pay attention to time equals zero, the beginning time, time equal three, the ending time, and any critical times. The critical times for this are found using this. So on my paper I write V of T equals zero at, and I find that time, 2.507. Now I know the particle will be farthest at one of these three times. So I just do integrals to find out where the particle is located at each of these three times. So that work was here. So I found that. I find the position at time zero, position at time two and a half, position at time three, and I just write my conclusion. Question. I don't know if that helped. Mm -hmm. okay. You can always say no. Yeah. I've never seen that. Question? Mm -hmm. You want bring a different question across, please. It's I was just wondering. It's kind of a little bit about too, but just like more of a kind of general question. So when we're finding uh, if something's differentiable or not, do, so we know that the left and right limits have to be the same. Does the f prime of it also have to be the same in order for it to be differentiable? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me talk to it. 
Okay. Um, really good question. Uh, this one, this this idea, not this question. This idea shows up pretty much every year on the AP test. Uh, so I put a note on the golden notes to help with that. So right here, front page, towards the bottom center. So I've got continuous, means no removable discontinuities, uh, no jumps, no vertical asymptotes. Okay, that description is useful if I have a graph to look at. Without a graph, I don't really pay attention to that. I pay attention to this definition. Same for differentiable. To be differentiable, I must first be continuous. That's why I underlined it. Yeah. Also, no corners or vertical tangents. If I can see a graph, that's easy to see. Without, I need this. So here's what Maddie's talking about, I believe. She's like, okay, good. So I'm gonna find the limit from the left and the right, and I'm also gonna find f of three. And as long as they're all the same, I know the function is continuous. To prove differentiability, you do the exact same thing, exact same thing with the derivative. So notice I'm checking all three. That's what you do. Thank you. Please. How's the three dots again? It has to be continuous in order to be differentiable. Right, so if the function is not continuous, I'm done. I just stop. Uh, if this one's false, this one has to be false. So, please. So, this is kind of related, but not necessarily on this problem. But sometimes, like, when do you know when to put in, like, a greater than or equal sign when you're doing the limit, like, of a displaced function? Like you're worried about this right yeah, here. Yeah, You're good. Hey, okay, all eyes on the board. It's crucial. When you take the derivative of a piecewise function, don't put in the equal sign to start with ever until you can verify that the function truly is differentiable. Um, so here, this equal sign really doesn't belong because what's happening is the value of the derivative a little bit before 3 is 1 which means the slope of the curve just before three is going to be one. So the picture would look something like this. Here's x equal three. This is my picture of f. So just before I get to x equal three, the slope's gonna be one. Just after x equal three, the slope's going to change and become four. Well, that's why you get a corner. So I cannot say that the derivative at x equal 3 is 1 because the derivative at x equal 3 doesn't exist because of the corner. So I really need to erase this little line right there. Is that what you meant? Follow-up questions? Maddie? We know to have a different question brought with me to class. Please, just 17. understand how to set it up. So you got stuck somewhere along the way. Yeah. Okay. So let me just go to the solution to save a little time. So here's the solution as posted on the website. We'll talk about it. here is a little bit different. I, 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 did, I used to do it this way and then I changed to it the way I think it's a little bit better. So we're supposed to be finding this integral. 
fact, let's do it on the other page. This is not the best writing. Hold on. Okay, so we've got 1 over 2, integral from 0 to 2, x squared, uh, square root, x cubed plus 1. So first step is to find the antiderivative, so I need to do a u substitution. So u is going to equal x cubed plus 1. questions to there. changes on this side. So I get equals one half. My new limits are one and nine. This becomes u raised to the one half. X squared dx is one third du. Questions to there. going to be one-sixth. The antiderivative would be u to the three-halves divided by three-halves. Bar one to nine. Dividing by three-halves, same as multiplying by two-thirds. Plug everything in. <coughs> That's one ninth. Square root of nine is three. Three cubed is twenty-seven. Twenty-seven minus one is twenty-six. you help me, it'll stick in your head better. Uh, this means you've got to do a square root and a cube. Okay. And you can pick which one comes first. It doesn't really matter. Uh, so I'm going to be a little bit sarcastic here. So do you know what 9 cubed is? I don't either. So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's just purely my point. Sometimes it would be better to do that first. But I don't know that one. So I'm not going to. Do you know what the square root of 9 is? No, not square. Square root. Good. So you take the three, now cube that. The order doesn't matter. So what's three cubed? Twenty seven. And then this one to any power is just one. So twenty seven minus one is twenty seven. I don't know if that helped though. Sure. Two points, two pebbles per dollar. The order is all in. Yeah, you can do it in either order. Let's bring a different question within the class. Please. Get out your golden notes. 
get your golden notes in front of you. If you've already done it, I'll just pay you the mega phone. If you haven't done it, you can earn a mega phone. If you've already done it, you get the mega phone already. Okay, look on your golden notes. Okay, all the derivative. So this says we're supposed to be finding the derivative of this integral. So all the derivative rules you'll need are on the left side of the golden notes. Just that column, go all the way down. Raise your hand when you can find the rule that you would need to use here. Show me your hand. So look down the left side of the golden notes until you find the rule that fits this situation. Then do your best to use that rule and see if it gives you the right answer. Once you have the right answer, or if you've done it before you came to class, raise your hand, I'll pay you. And if you have a question when I come by, just ask. asking a really good question. Uh, when you look at the golden nodes, you're using this rule right here, which shows how to find the derivative of an integral. Um, this says d over dx, that's why this is over dx. When I look at the problem on the test, I have d over dx, that's why it'll still be over dx. The t is really just a temporary variable. It's just there to keep track of what happens during the integration. It's not really a, a real variable. The x is the real variable. So. But you need to pay attention to that on each problem. So. Anybody else have it? It's payment? Did I answer your question, Lindsay? Good. Yeah, that's the best way on that one is to like see the formula. Just make sure you can step through the formula and you're in good shape. Because so. that shows up on the test that Anyone else? Isaac? Good job today. Well done.
Oh, I know how these